The reason why I like surprise over advertised is because the free shipping threshold is really important for us. I don't wanna say suck if we sell a single unit, but they're 20 points worse. So we want you thinking and purchasing as if it's there. However, the reality of you needing to pay five or $7 for shipping at the point that you get the checkout does have a material impact yeah. and it worsens the conversion rate there. Welcome back to another episode of Chew on CRO, part of the IntelliGem series. I got my host today, Drew from IntelliGems. We have a really special guest today, Dave, the president of Bamboo Earth. Some of you might know him on Twitter as Mr. Margins or even Costcap president. <laughs> um, I am really excited or we are really excited to, to chat through some of the uh, CRO tips, tactics, um, recent wins that you know uh, Dave has had. Um, talk a little bit about cost caps for those who are interested. And uh, for those who may not know who you are um, and kind of your background, give, give everybody a little uh, tidbit and then what you're up to today. Yeah, so uh, I'm Dave, uh, I, I'm president at Bamboo Earth. Um, I, I came up through 4x400, uh, which was a, a, a roll up um, kind of play. Um, we sold off the other assets in 4x400 and focused on Bamboo Earth. Um, that's how, how I kind of wound up there. Um, and about a decade before, I spent uh, on the agency side, uh, all in e-commerce and mostly in marketing. So, yeah. Amazing. So um, for those who have maybe listened to some of the previous episodes, um, I give a lot of shout out to Dave because we've kind of transitioned our whole way of marketing um, over the last like 18 months. And so if you if you follow us on Twitter and kind of what we're talking about is that we moved our whole ad account over to uh, cost caps. And there's a lot of debate about does it work? What kind of you know brands can this work for? How do you get it to work for your brand? You know, and so over the last 18 months, you know, Dave and I have kind of gone back and forth on how do we get things to spend? How do we kind of you know improve volume, um, especially when it revolves around cost caps, which can be limiting to certain brands, right? And one of the biggest things that we always talk about is some of our CRO tests and wins. Um, and for those who aren't familiar with how cost caps work, essentially you're telling you know Meta, here's a here's a CPA where I'd like to be around. Um, if you can get that for me, then spend, right? Um, and if you can't, don't spend. But one of the factors that really goes into this is the the overall consumer journey and the experience, and a lot of that ties into your funnel's conversion rate. And so if you want to improve spend and volume, one of the things that you should be working on is improving conversion rate optimization, revenue per session, profit per session. I want to go into how you guys think about conversion rate optimization um, as it ties into kind of our marketing strategies. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so to, to, to expand on what you just said around uh, the, the funnel optimization and maximizing the revenue per session, uh, the, the way I've philosophically always thought about this is that um, you're paying a CPM on a platform. So you're, you're going to pay, you know, d depends maybe $10, $20, $30, depending on what your industry you're in. Um, and the winners that are going to be able to gobble up the most market share are those that are going to be able to most efficiently turn CPMs into margin per thousand or profit per thousand, variable profit per thousand. And so from the full chain of like when the user is exposed to the ad to the point where they transact, um, and actually, I think I even think about it kind of beyond that, the full chain of the value that you get out of that user and uh, working backwards from the impression. So uh, optimizing that and being the the brand that pushes the envelope on margin per thousand means you're going to be the one setting the auction rate, the market clearing rate for CPMs. Um, and so in an auction environment, you obviously want to be able to do that. And so wins anywhere in that chain translate to volume growth or efficiency growth. Um, and so the, one of the reasons I like uh, cost caps and, and kind of tie it back to that is um, a, high, a highest volume or, or a, um, a concept of I'm gonna spend a, a flat amount and I'm gonna get what efficiency comes to me. You have direct control over the volume and indirect control over the efficiency. And so what what I prefer is direct control over the efficiency and indirect control over the volume. And so we can we can know that we're gonna drive profitable spend and then the volume, we're gonna work hard on those long-term, you know, midterm, long-term levers and and start to tilt that in our favor. 
um, and expand that volume. Uh, but all the while, we're going to hold a, a certain level of efficiency. So that's kind of philosophically how I think about the channel and what those wins um, often mean for us. Yeah. So in aggregate, you know, if you can drive 100 visitors to the site, right. you've got a really good handle on how many profit dollars you're going to get from them right. or, or per thousand. Right. And so you can like almost assure built in profitability, provided your numbers hold right. by saying, I will bid up to that amount. I will spend up to that amount for these visitors because right. I'm confident I can then right. exactly. convert them into real dollars yeah. at the end of the day. Yeah, exactly. And then what, what you always want to be doing is pushing that number of, of your revenue and your profit up per you know, per session yeah. or per, per thousand views on. Uh, because on you could go, if, if you're able to afford <clears throat> 30 bucks or 40 bucks per, right. for the CPM for the thousand visitors, then you're going to go right. outbid everyone else. Exactly. Find a lot more volume. And what I, what I often find is that like, you know, a 20% win on efficiency might translate to 100% more volume because very often there's, there's a big broad audience just outside your efficiency that is waiting there for you Right. And if you're like, hey, I, you know, I would be good at a one five. Well, if you were able to run at a one two or a one two five, you could, you know, double your your volume. And that's that's true for a lot of brands. A lot of brands know that. But if the the one two five all of a sudden becomes a one five, right, like from an, a, a CRO gain or from an efficiency gain, then you're able to go experience that kind of asymmetrical upside of, you know, that extra hundred percent volume. So that's why I look at it as like a. Um, you know, again, a 10, 20, 30% gain in efficiency um, of, of that user, um, you know, efficiency of uh, margin per session or revenue per session. Yeah, profit per visitor. Can, yeah, can translate back to a, um, you know, a, a disproportionate gain in, yeah. in the total volume. It's like you don't need to, you don't need to, you're actually not worried about pocketing that extra profit right. today. No. Instead, it lets you go right. spend less efficiently, right. top of funnel access, like a whole new right. audience. Exactly. Yeah. To expand that, that spend. The, the way that I actually think about it is also the conversations that I have recently with founders, um, most of them being on you know automatic bidding, highest volume, right? And so the conversation is always how do I how do I account for an increase in CAC, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're you're constantly spending 10, 20k a day without fail, mm -hmm. no matter what your efficiency is, um, the goal is to continuously improve your metrics, and, and those metrics are conversion rate, revenue per session, profit per session, right? Now, if we are able to kind of cut back on the days where performance isn't as great, okay? Right. And we start to feel this like slump, and, and I'm sure you feel it, we feel it too, like during the summer, where naturally there are less people on right. social media, right. inventory is limited. Um, for us cost cappers, it's, it's gonna be the period of, okay, well, I'm gonna be efficient, but lower volume, mm -hmm. okay? And to your point is, if I can get and send back a signal to Meta saying, hey, I've now improved my conversion rate 20%. That means my efficiency is 20% better. I can afford a little bit more. My volume starts to go up, right? So for us, it's always a, you know what? I need to run at least two tests um, a month so that we can stack our wins over time. So that when we do hit these, the, the slumps of the summer or, um, you know, right before like Q4, we're able to still spend and maintain some type of volume, right? right. So I want to get into your process. Maybe a dumb yeah. question. Uh, are you going in and changing the cost cap that you're accepting, or you're saying because the conversion rate is going up, Facebook has more confidence of hitting the CPA? So like how often are you changing yeah. the actual cap? No, that's a great question. So for me, I set my bid at around, say our, our break even is around a $47 CPA. My bids are probably at around $40 right now. And so when I do have those wins, the bid stays the same, but Facebook will start to spend more. Volume. Yeah. Volume will start to increase <clears throat> because now conversion rate has now yeah. increased. And so typically I think as that time period or that spend starts to ramp up, you're seeing an improvement in efficiency but then Facebook will start to spend more, and then I guess your, your your CPAs will start to creep back up into that equilibrium part. Right, right, yeah. right. As it, as it learns the new normal of your conversion rate or the new normal of yeah. And so one one thing I want to add to that really quick is that a lot of people think of uh, manual bids or cost caps as strictly downside protection because that's a lot of like what gets talked about, especially on uh, on Twitter, 
is uh, is limiting the downside of things like testing or things like just bad spend, eliminating bad spend. But the, the truth is, like, I'm equally attracted to it because of the like the upside. Um, and Ash, you know, like. I, I talk about like all the, I call them mattress holidays. Like all the, like, when is a mattress company gonna run a sale? That's a mattress holiday to me. Memorial yeah. so Day, like, July 4th. Yeah, yeah, Memorial Day, Day. July, yeah, Labor Day, et cetera. So all those mattress holidays, like they became that way for a reason in the same sense that like Black Friday was originally like a natural event. And then marketers noticed that and poured on top of that. Well, like each of these mattress holidays are kind of a natural spike, right? Like Memorial Day, we we had a huge spike over the weekend for Memorial Day. July 4th weekend, we're gonna do the same thing. President's Day weekend is actually one of the biggest weekends for us. Uh, New Year's, we go, we go way up. And I'm talking like 10X a normal daily spend, hmm. like uh, massively. So without a system that, like how would we confidently know it's 10X and not 12X or not 8x, right? So to like hit it on the nose, because if you were using just budgets, you'd have to go, uh, I don't know, and kind of ballpark yeah, or, like or adjust there midday. The day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, be there midday, which like there's all sorts of flaws in that. But the benefit of having that like that confidence in like, oh, I can put this number in, it's going to deliver at that, um, is that you can go scale 10x on a you know or a product launch um, or you know whatever it is, whether it's a you created marketing event or kind of a natural marketing event. Either way, you have the ability to go 5, 10x up in spend to go c capture it while it's there. And then, like you said, oh, you know, it's summer, it's you know, mid July, people are on vacation, pulling back a little bit. My product doesn't move as much at that, during that time. Fine, go protect the profit and pull back a little bit then, but go be aggressive when the opportunity is there. Right. So, so especially on those holidays, is that you kind of uh, assuming you're running a sale, right? So it naturally right. improves conversion <clears throat> rate, which will then for some volume right are you at that point kind of adjusting bids to account for that if i'm so if there is no sale and it's a natural bump upward then no because it, essentially I, there's no data that is outside of the system outside of meta's algorithm that it doesn't know so it should be reasonably good at the uh the machine learning and predicting what my conversion rate is going to be and it sees a bunch of new inventory come up and it says cool we can go run some more volume at it if I am running a sale, the thing that happens is that um, the trailing seven day conversion rate is now not very predictive of my forward looking conversion rate. So like mm -hmm. I just did something outside the system. They don't know that I just did a 20% off or, you know, whatever gift with purchase or whatever it is. And so I've got to account for that. And um, and usually that is using some some kind of historical, like I, I, I have a bit of a playbook, like, okay, I've got, you know, here's this holiday coming up. I've run this sort of ramp up sale a dozen times before I know exactly kind of how this is going to go. But generally speaking, you know, my bids will go up like 20% or something like that because I know my conversion rate is actually going to go up 30%. Yeah, you're right? going to overperform yeah. Facebook's estimate. <clears throat> and then if it's a four day weekend, I'm actually stepping them back down to normal mm -hmm. throughout the weekend. And then just before it ends, I'm taking it way low. And my my mm. my philosophy on that is protect the profit. Like, you know, I, I, I have a higher AOV. So like my my cost caps are um, set to around like 90, 95. And so, you know, starting the weekend, I might be up at 115 and I'm bringing it down to 95 throughout the weekend. And let's say it ends Sunday night going into Monday, cut them to like 70. And just make sure that Monday morning you don't walk into like 10 grand of spend that is trash or, yeah. you know, five grand of spend and you just like wasted your profits for the day. And then, you know, you're going to eventually come back up to that standard. So th when you're doing something outside the system that you have a unique data point, that's where it doesn't matter how sophisticated the machine learning is, they can't know it. Right. Yeah. And so they, that's they can't when, know that you cut the sale yeah. at midnight. Pacific exactly. Sunday night and <clears throat> exactly. conversion rate is going to drop 30%. So that, and I might look at like trailing seven days or trailing 14 days and adjust the cap up or down, just mm -hmm. like actuals that are coming in versus like what I'm trying to put, you know, as a target for the system. Right. But th those are nudges less. Makes less, sense. You know. yeah. So when it comes down to cost cappers increasing spend, right? Um, I think, in my opinion, I think creative, like constantly having new creative is is a way to keep things constant. Yeah. Um, CRO is what's actually going to increase volume, right? So um, at Bamboo, how do you guys um, kind of set up a 
a roadmap for for testing and what is that like what goes into into that yeah i mean so a lot of it works backward from the customer experience and customer research and and both looking at the data uh looking at you know, we do lots of post-purchase surveying. We do lots of uh, post, um, not just post-purchase on like the confirmation, but also uh, your item ships. And then within 48 hours, we send you a survey. And I re I've read all of those. There's like, you know, 3,000, 4,000 uh, lines in the, in the document. I try to sum them up. And we do like, we do a lot of analysis um, and not just like load it into chat GPT and like get the insights. And that's like, within 48 hours of me receiving the product. Yeah. So you want my first impression yes. of like. And by the way, so like it, here's here's to show how important feedback is and how important that first impression is, is we we have you rate, rate your experience one through four. And I chose four so that there's you can't give a middle ground. Yeah. No right? You've got to choose generally good or generally mm -hmm. bad, right? Um, that That rating is extremely predictive of your future LTV mm. within 48 hours. Like, how was their first experience? And so I pour over that feedback. Um, and then I, I've also, you know, we run a lot through like our quiz. And like, so that means that we're selling a bunch of different kind of bundles at different price points and stuff. And so I'm looking at which ones are converting the best, which ones are driving the, the best take rate of the higher priced bundle versus the lower price bundle. And so generally digging in through that creates some kind of an insight that, that I, then I work backward to oh, here's the test I'm going to run that is going to go improve our revenue per session capture. Um, and it's usually a theory. Like, um, I'll give you a great example is like, we uh, we originally ha had our, our quiz offer that we only sold a two-week bundle and we introduced a three-month bundle. That was, so that's about six times the volume at about three times the price, roughly. You know, varied kit by kit. But so we noticed immediately people were taking about uh, about 30% were taking the bigger version. And so I said, okay, well, what can I do to like just push that a little bit harder, right? Because if we could drive that up to 40 or 50%, I could disproportionately win on average order value and not affect conversion rate at yeah, all. Yeah, because that was like a $170 kit or something yeah, up yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, in, in that range. Like, again, they, 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 I think you're right actually on the average, but they were, you know, 150 to like yep. do something. Um, and depending on the skin type of the kit. And so we came up with the concept of putting like a, a, a free gift on the full size. So not only was it six times the volume at three X the price, so much better value, but now there was a gift attached to it that, and, and so it actually drove the, the likelihood that they were gonna purchase that kit up to 50%. So half of our sessions are now purchasing a $150, $200 kit, and it drove our AOV up again, which again, conversion rate just stayed even. And it was really just a, a, and it's actually a higher margin kit too. So margin per session was, went up considerably. And then we could pour that money back into advertising volume. Yeah. 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 Cause your, your conversion stayed the same. Right. AOV goes up. So revenue per visit goes up and your margin stayed stable. I think was a bit higher even after the free gift. Yes. So then it's like, great. Exactly. I'm extracting win win 30% more profit from every person who lands. And it's honestly, it's win win. That's the best kinds of offers are win win. It's like, my customer is getting more product, a free gift. They're happier. They have three months to try my product instead of two weeks. Uh, their LTV in the long run is higher. Yeah. Like win, win, win. And our margins are better because generally speaking, you're shipping more, you're offsetting those fixed costs yep. and like pick and pack and whatever. And so it's win, win, win down the line. You know, if you can find those kinds of offers. Um, this sounds easy, but it took us like, <laughs> 10 tests to, yeah. <laughs> to be able to figure out exactly what that a was. A wide configuration of like 16 alternate yeah, pages. Yeah. And yeah. so, uh, but when it hits, it has a really huge, it's a, it's a step function for the business. And so it's like, that's why I care so much. And like, I'm the president of the business and I care and I'm getting the details of these kinds of tests because it has that big of an impact. Yeah, that boost to your, you know, profit per visitor, Huge. profit per thousand, let you go like double spend yeah. on yeah. marketing. Yeah, I mean, when we, when we did that initial jump from just selling the two week kit to the to selling the three month plus the two week kit, we tripled spend. We we went yeah. from spending 100K to over 300K. How did, I'm, I'm gonna, you did a really interesting one around shipping for new customers. Mm -hmm. I think you guys did this too, maybe. Um, yeah. Can you talk about that test and also how how did you get to that insight? In general, I've noticed that new customers are more price elastic than 
repeat customers. Mm-hmm. So they're more more yeah, pricing. We've seen that across right? the board. Yeah. Okay. And most marketers are familiar with this that you're saying, hey, I'll trade discount dollars for advertising dollars as long as I can trade eight discount dollars for ten advertising dollars win, right? Um, and so uh, on free shipping, that was an obvious point of sticking. Um, and so Ash kind of inspired me with this one. Uh, the way you tested and implemented, I believe, was a, a surprise, right? Mm-hmm. Like surprise free shipping. Mm-hmm. And so we do the same because um, the reason why I liked surprise over advertised is because the free shipping threshold is really important for us. Like our margins, I don't want to say suck if we sell a single unit, but they're 20 points worse yeah. compared to our av- We average over five units per shipment. Five, I think it's 5.5. Um, so we average 5.5 units per shipment. And the, the minimum threshold is really important to press that. So we want you thinking and purchasing as if it's there. However, the reality of you needing to pay 5 or $7 for shipping at the point that you get the checkout does have a material impact yeah. on, you know, on, and it worsens the, uh, um, the, um, the conversion rate there. So actually we, we originally tested this with IntelliGems and then we did the long-term impl- implementation with PDQ, uh, pretty damn quick, mm-hmm. think, right? Mm-hmm. And so, uh, yeah, we tested it with IntelliGems and we uh, specifically looked at uh, segmented by UTM source. Uh, so it was actually same session with, uh, with like Facebook ads or cool. meta ads. Um, and we saw a significant lift, more than paid for the, the shipping offset and, uh, and decided, you know, let's just push into that as, a, as an evergreen standard. And then what's, what's nice about the, on the, the PDQ side is they're using the actual like customer profile attribute. Um, so like the test we ran with you was probably a little bit narrower. Just focused on, yeah, you it, came it, from the right funnel, you ex- must be new. If, yeah, and, and it was, and that's 98% true. Um, and, but it's a little bit narrower because there are people that like come from that funnel then come back. And you know, obviously UTMs like uh, don't represent the full full value capture for a place like Meta. Um, and then so we implemented it like that uh, kind of long term and it's been, uh, you know, again, another another yeah. lift in terms of. Yeah, it's really clever to have, like you get the AOV behavior mm-hmm. up front. All right, right. like get, make the cart you're gonna make. Right. And if they don't hit it, it's like, well, it's a sunk cost for me now. That's right. Like let's reduce cart abandonment. That's right. Um, <laughs> get the order. Surprise and delight is always, always yeah. a good thing when the customer journey. So um, that is, I, I always like tell people shipping is a form of pricing. Like people are yeah. like, it's not pricing like that. Absolutely, along with discounting is part of pricing. Right. And you and I have talked for years about like what will dynamic pricing look like in e-commerce. Right. Like I think that's kind of an example of dynamic pricing of, hey, Certainly. this segment versus that. <clears throat> I know you do some some segmented uh, approaches there, but like what is, how have you used dynamic pricing topics at Bamboo? I think of it more in terms of like, segmented i mean it's a form of dynamic like like in that sense it's dynamic rules it's based. dynamically changing yeah yeah exactly it's rules based right and so yeah we 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 see a lot more price sensitivity from first-time customers versus versus repeat customers and so uh and that makes a lot of sense like especially in industries where uh a huge part of the dollar amount of them buying a thing is built into convincing them to buy it. Marketing, right? Like, so if 40% of your P&L is marketing and like, you know, 20 or 30% is like the product, right? Well, that means that they're, they're literally paying more to be convinced that your product is good than they are for the actual <laughs> substance of the product. Yeah. And that's true. And so if you think about that being true, and, and by the way, that 40% is disproportionately spent on first-time customers, like almost all yeah. or all of it is spent on first-time customers. So um, so it's even higher for that initial initial order. So if that's true, then having an item in hand means that you've removed that need to be proven that uh, that this is good, does work for me, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. It's and so obviously, if you have a good product, your price sensitivity on future orders is going to to, to kind of melt away or or significantly lessen. Going back to kind of dynamic, we do a lot of the segmentation around first first customer versus uh, versus repeat. Um, and actually, we've actually branched off a little bit further than that as we started to think about like product categories. Um, so an interesting thing we we did is we've never sold as much in terms of like body uh, body products, so like body moisturizers or oils or. Um, and so I put together a kit. Uh, 
I love kits because they push the AOV and they, they make the economics a lot better. Um, and I, I marked it 40% off. And it's a one-time use coupon code. So, you know, once per customer. And everybody that purchases any product that is in that category, a body product, goes through a Shopify flow that tags them as a body buyer. And then I will never send them that offer again. Hmm. Both, and I actually run this on Facebook ads and I exclude that audience, that segment from Klaviyo. Um, and I also run like uh, emails or funnels, uh, both in, in a flow as well as like periodic campaigns, like, you know, twice a quarter or something like that. And it does really well. And we, we, picked, we picked up significant, uh, it's n still not a big category for us because you're talking about like it goes down the funnel of mm -hmm. like, hit your site, purchased, is interested in body, buys body, right? So it's like, it's always gonna be a smaller percentage of your overall, mm -hmm. but I mean, it's five figures of, of yeah. revenue every month that I'm not paying, pretty much not paying ad spend for, or if I am running ad spend, it's like at a, like five X, it's like super efficient. Um, so that's that's a good example of kind of, you know, I think about it as segmented, but it, it, yeah, your, it's like an introductory introductory offer to a part of the catalog yeah. rather than even the brand. Overall. Because if you take the whole the same concept of like first versus repeat in their price sensitivity, the same is true when you jump product categories. Yeah, like they don't necessarily trust you yet for product category B just because they trusted you for product category A. They probably have given you more leniency and more trust than somebody who's never interfaced with your products. But they don't they don't trust you yet on on that right and and the more different it is the more true that is if you're selling you know mattresses and then sleep supplements like that's a pretty different game right like, yeah so uh so you're probably going to have to convince that that customer to, to make that leap on on product category b and so yeah that's that's one of the ways we've used it so one thing around this marketing strategy with with cost caps is i think a lot of us are trying to optimize for aov um, and sometimes that means selling more products up front um, than potentially getting somebody into subscription or whatever it is. Um, curious your thoughts on subscription models. Do you guys kind of implement it throughout the funnel? Um, memberships, I know you guys are big on, so talk to us about that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and so I agree, yeah, the the LTV side, basically how to optimize for that. And that's it's it's another jump from just the same session, yeah. you know, like it's another leap. You have to like connect data points. There's like an immediate feedback loop. If you're looking at this right. session of I paid this much, this is how much they paid. Right. Me. Did I make money or not? Now and it's, it's like, well, if you're the impatient marketer that sits there and smashes <laughs> refresh on the dashboard, running LTV tests sucks. Like it, <laughs> you're, you're like 90 days out and you're like, all right, I'm finally getting feedback. 90 days is an eternity in terms of testing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we, we do think a lot about that. And I, I think about uh, both um, like automatic recurring to me is a different revenue quality. And it, it, like, if you think about like, you know, M and A activity or like mergers and acquisitions, generally speaking, they'll put a higher value on companies that have automatic recurring SAS. revenue. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> and SaaS industry exists. <laughs> SaaS also is like even the gold standard of annual yeah. ARR, like uh, so uh, versus MRR. So we have MRR and it's uh, more churny than SaaS, but but still, it is a higher revenue quality than like you know, discretionary one-time purchases. Um, and so I think about that as well as like expanding that LTV. And so um, I'll back up to kind of why we did memberships at all in the first place. And then uh, I could tell you a little bit about how we uh, implemented it using uh, some A-B testing up front. The behavior I noticed on product subscriptions is we capped out, and actually we, we originally were on recharge and then we migrated to stay um, and stay had a better, uh, more tools for retention. And we, we tapped into some of those, right? And we were able to kind of lift where our product subscriptions were. Uh, I wouldn't, I wanna say like up 30 to 40%, like total, wow. like lifted the ceiling. Um, but again, we started to hit a ceiling in terms of like the product subscription revenue as a percentage of our total repeat revenue. That's how I think about it. Cause it's repeat customers. Yep. So it, it's more consistent as a percentage of repeat revenue, right? And so I started to hit a ceiling around 20%. And um, the thing that made me think that there was more opportunity there is that people were, were churning because of the UX and unit economics of subscription more than the idea of a commitment. And that this is no blowback on Stay at all. Like I, I actually really like the Stay platform. This is just the concept of 
agreeing to get a single product shipped to your house, right? Yeah. And and actually part of the way the Shopify subscriptions treat it. Um, so a lot of our products recur on different cadences. So you have one that recurs on three, two months, one that recurs on three months. Well, those are different orders and they ship at different times. And if we go back to the unit economics, that's not great for me. I'm paying to pick, pack, and ship a single unit. Pick, pack, and ship a single unit. And then I'm layering on discounts, incentives, free shipping. And so margins were actually, some of my worst margins were in single unit product subscriptions. Yeah, right? pick, pick, pack, and ship would probably be more like a fixed cost. Exactly. If, for adding two exactly. things to the box. Right, no, it, 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 it literally is, especially for the deal that I negotiated with our uh, 3PL, it is literally a, a fixed cost. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Up until eight items, I think it is, uh, that we that we do. So I got interested in memberships when I saw um, Adore Me got acquired. It was like 600 million or something mm -hmm. like that, a huge amount. And Adore Me had a membership model and you know, then I noticed Fabletics running the, the membership model. And so they're running it a bit different, but I started to think about this idea of like, the thing that appealed to me about a membership is it's a monthly commitment, an automatically recurring commitment. And actually originally I thought like quarterly, but it's a recurring commitment that doesn't have an exact shipment tied to it. So I could still get them to come back and purchase in these like $100 AOV, five items, you know, whatever it is. Right. And in a way that is much better for me unit economic wise, I could resolve some of the like CX concerns about like, you know, sometimes we sell to an older demographic and they want to like push the shipment. They're having trouble doing that on SMS. And again, like all the tools there are great, but you're talking to a 60 year old who wants to push a shipment. It's just totally different than, right? We thought we could resolve some of that by having a vague commitment for a dollar amount that you're then credited back. Uh, and I went through a lot of different like ways of like creating this. I originally, like the value of this was gonna be like a cash back thing. It was gonna be like 10% mm -hmm. cash back or 15% cash back. I originally thought about it on a like quarterly basis because that's actually the cadence that our customers generally order yep. on like three months. That's about how long the, the product lasts. Um, so I, I originally had all these ideas about how the program was gonna be and, and what its impact to LTV was gonna be. And so, uh, I had an idea, let me test this against new customers first, because if you roll out a membership program and you get thousands of members in your returning customer base, and then you designed it poorly, it's a one -way door. you are screwed. Yeah. <laughs> like it is a painful process to rip that off and, and re, I'm not saying you can't, but it's difficult, right? And I certainly can't just like throw them out, discard them easily, move on to the next. And I think I tested like four different implementations of this program before finally locking on it. And so like, I think it was June, July, I started testing them and then I did a full launch in October. But June, July, I started running A-B tests with IntelliGems. And what I would do is my, my uh, incoming new customer offer pages, uh, they had a version that had the membership there at all and a version that did not. So uh, membership offer exposed versus not exposed at all, right? And so the the when people see data for subscription or memberships, they rightfully always say, "Well, yeah, that's self-selecting. Of course, your best cost. Of mm -hmm. course, you're going to have the best LTV on your subscribers. They're your best customers. They're the ones willing to commit. So that's self-selecting. But in my case, I actually had two audiences that have already controlled for self-selection because one of them couldn't see a membership, yep. right? And so, um, and so the nice thing about that is I could actually follow the LTV of the entire segment and say, does being exposed to a membership offer increase the LTV as this customer segment or not, irrespective of whether they opted in or you know what the value of those that yeah. opted in is. Um, and so we did that and I, I did see a lift. It was about 20% in terms of like the uh, 90 day LTV lift for that and i was realizing it really fast because it recurs every month mm -hmm. 40 dollars every month so you're actually getting cash in hand really fast mm -hmm. um so both those things i said great <laughs> let's roll it out we found the program uh and then we rolled it out and between product subscriptions memberships and now amazon sns uh subscribe and save because we we kind of push that a little bit more aggressively so i think about those three we're now just shy of 50 percent of recurring revenue being some form of automatic recurring um, so of all repeat customer revenue, about yes, 50%. About 50% is, is automatically wow. recurring, wow. up from 20%. So hitting that ceiling at 20%. So we can we configure it in a way that like 
yes, now between all of these options, half of the revenue that comes in is is on a commitment, automatic recurring yep. commitment. And I can you can definitely tell my revenue is a lot lot a lot more stable in that sense. Um, and actually has more to do with like when the recurring charges hit, oh, mm -hmm. you got 10K of memberships processed yeah. today. <laughs> Just had a good day, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's a lot more stable in that sense. Um, so I, and, and it's been very sticky. So um, those changes have definitely been a good thing. And, and testing it, implementing it, gave me the confidence that it actually is an LTV lift. Because mm -hmm. again, I'm gonna go give them 15% off store wide. Like, yep. is that a good thing? Did I just cannibalize? Like, I don't know. So to be able to test that beforehand, confidently say, yeah, that discount is worth it and this commitment is worth it um, and uh, and know that going forward conclusively. Yeah. You know? Now, you know, when you add a robust subscription program, you add a robust membership program, that first order, your AOV is probably going to go down. It does, yeah. Uh, your profit on those orders is going to go down. Yeah. You, you know that there's an LTV yeah. value on them. Like, how do you from that feed test. that LTV value back into your testing, like, back into your cost? Yeah, price? from that initial test that we yep. did with you guys, because you can split the cohort and you can look, does the AOV decrease, does this yep. decrease, et cetera. And so I can look at like the total value, first order inclusive of that customer and say, did it raise that? And so that's actually what I'm talking about when I say 20%. It's inclusive of, oh, wow. of the initial order. So whatever negative impact it had on the initial order, it's inclusive that cohort of that. By it's day caused, 90 has yeah, just it's compounded out, a ton. Outpaced it. Yeah, exactly. And so what what I actually do is it's a simple export from IntelliGems and then I marry that up with um, so like IntelliGems gives you a lot of different data points that you could use. They give you order ID, order name, and I think customer, customer email yeah. or customer email. Um, any of those, you could just go to a sales over time report and add that column. And so it's instead of exp exporting all orders, cause that comes with every line item, you just do it from a sales over time report. Uh, and then it's a simple like sum if. Cool. Yeah. I think you can also set up a flow probably to tag people with what group yeah. they're exposed to. Yeah, but I, I I I do a good amount of like manual analysis. Excel but master. yeah, but like again, you you have like the person in some form, the initial order, the customer, whatever, and then you just follow them through and put their lifetime yep. value on it and then add it up by cohort. So especially with that test, right? Knowing that if we're now testing memberships or subscriptions, uh conversion rate or AOV comes down a little bit, right? Yep. Um did it affect conversion rate at all or no, guys? no. So like oh, most of my wins have been from things that hold conversion rate steady and then add, add AOV or add LTV. Those have been most of my wins. There are areas, uh, the opposite is true with free shipping. That juiced conversion rate, but brought AOV down slightly and, mm -hmm. and margin down slightly, but it juiced conversion rate so much that it was worth it. Um, but a lot of my wins are hold conversion rate steady and, and increase, uh, increase the value. And the, probably the, the most common place where we've had difficulty where you're configuring a more complicated offer and it, and it winds up actually negatively impacting conversion rate is around offer clarity. And so if you make an offer that is too complex to understand or the full value isn't understood, yeah. or if it casts a negative light on the, on the low value, you know, the low AOV option, then that can also negatively impact. For instance, like we we tried something that was um, after adding the main kit to your cart, we did an interstitial pop up. This is like basically before you got to your cart, we we're going to try to upsell them like our i products, and we went like really aggressive on it, mm -hmm. and it actually tanked conversion rate because part of the belief of the quiz is that you've recommended me the products that are needed for me, mm -hmm. and that there isn't more that I need. Like I already went yeah, through weighing this. I feel like this. I'm getting a great deal. Yeah, yeah, I already went through weighing this and you told me this was what, what was for my skin, yeah. right? And then you just hit me with a thing that's like, but wait, there's more, <laughs> you know? Like, and so that tanked conversion rate because you, it, it wasn't that you did anything to those initial offers, but you created this perception that yeah, the initial you, offer was worse than they originally thought. You took like the good, better, best framing. Right. You made it look like a better right. or best offer. Mm -hmm. And now it just right. looks like <clears throat> good. Exactly. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's kind of why I think, I don't know, my, my new stump is like CRO is a very dumb name for testing. Yeah. Cause like <laughs> the big wins, maybe conversion rate stays the same or like, right. You can have very different, your conversion could go down, your AOV could go down, but yeah. your margin percent goes way up and like 
that's a big win. I mean, you, you had that offer test no, we talked about before. No, you literally took the words right out of my mouth. I you were given like yeah. way too much value away, but yeah. jacking up orders and top line. Yeah, I mean, they call it, right, CRO, conversion rate optimization. I was like, you know what? I'm going to toss in some free gifts, adjust the discount, boom, conversion rate increases. Yeah. But I didn't even calculate the profit margin on what those offers look like. Right. And so it, it hurt the business quite a bit, right? I had a break even return of like, oh, I gotta be at a two X. Mm -hmm. And that at scale is really tough. And so when you kind of remove all those elements and do a test that goes against conversion rate, but can increase profit um, per session, those are the wins that we're starting to look at now more often. For sure. Or one of my inspirations at one point was to, to test a quiz funnel. And it, and it came a lot from you because I think your quiz has been um, consistently performing and we never got it to work. So we always went back to our like long form landing pages and, 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 and I respect you guys for, for having this, this funnel because one, not only does it collect a lot of, uh, zero party data for customers, um, you're, you're getting, you're giving personalized results. You're giving very tailored answers and, and product bundles so that not only is your conversion rate higher, but your LTV is a lot better. Right. right? And then not to mention your email marketing and SMS is probably on fire too, right? right? So um, this being a very core component to the brand and acquisition, um, what are some of the, you know, the, the key elements that go into testing this quiz over time? How do you improve it? Um, how, like, is there even a way to improve something that's so like dialed in right now? The typical trope of like, the better you get at it, the more you see opportunity in it. Um, the, you the know, more you know, the, the worse, more you realize you don't know yet. <laughs> yeah, the more you realize you're not good at this. Um, and so uh, we we did a good job of making the, uh, the quiz one of our primary means of acquisition, like you said. And uh, it wasn't always the only thing that we focused on, but I, I consistently would run, you know, X offer where I was just driving it to a, a conversion. And then I'd also run a version that went to the quiz and then the quiz version would just scale better and I'd get more out of it. And the LTVs were great out of the quiz. So it's like, all right, so we just kind of continued to lean into and, and evolve the quiz. And especially when we went through a lot of that offer testing that I talked about, it just made it so much more efficient to continue sending to that. Um, and so one of the key things I think is really important for a quiz is that um, we're in an industry where there is legitimately value in guiding customers to the right product. And actually a great uh, um, you know, measuring stick for this is like, does your industry have paid professionals that assign the right product? We have estheticians and spas. Like that's an entire industry that just is about putting the right product on your skin, right? Like, mm -hmm. so like it supports an entire cast of professionals that are to tell you what skincare to use, right? So like there's obviously enough mystery and enough alpha in like guiding people to the right product. And the same thing is true of like beauty. Like beauty has a lot of, of that baked into it. And uh, I'm sure that in various ways, supplements as well um, has, has that to it. So that being one thing is that like, I do think that just sort of my, my industry or my product line is predisposed to being good for that sort of thing and customers genuinely wanting that sort of thing more than it being like just a kind of superficial BuzzFeed quiz type thing where they just like doing quizzes. Um, so I think it was predisposed to, uh, to be a, a good thing for us. In, what we started to get into more is to start to think about uh, the pre-quiz, during quiz and post quiz and, and like think about them separately. And so we launched with Octane uh, Octane AI, and uh, it, we previously were on Typeform and uh, essentially kind of duct taped together with Zapier and uh, and whatnot. And uh, and what we built with Octane is a more dynamic version where we get an output and we can we can write a script specifically and give them a, a very custom output and a custom page, right? But the other thing that it allows us to do is isolate that pre-quiz, during quiz, and post quiz as three different things, and. Um, so that pre-quiz is now as easy as a landing page where it mm. previously had to be built into Typeform kind of thing. So it's as easy as a landing page. And so now we're thinking a lot about like, okay, well, we're talking about dry skin versus we're talking about breakouts or we're talking about this. And so we're sending them through a pre-quiz page. Probably based off the ad they clicked that is on. Based on the ad they clicked on that is talking about the problems focused on that ad, right? Even if, if the quiz is the best way to ultimately drive them to a transaction, we're still continuing to be consistent and qualify them instead of putting them on a sort of generic quiz page. And that way they feel like I landed in the right spot as opposed to being like, 
what what is this? Like, yeah, why are you talking <laughs> you know, about body care? Like you know, I had yeah. Hand. And so we found we've sent, found some from, some value in doing that. And then the quiz itself, we continue to find more and more value of like add branching logic. So again, like you told me that you have breakouts frequently. Okay, where are they located? How frequently? Uh, have you been diagnosed with any of these medical conditions? How you blah, 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 blah. And so like we have branching logic that like people will tolerate more in a longer quiz when it's about like Digging the thing they want to solve. Just told me. You know, yeah. I, I forget who it was who was talking about like an hour long video being one of their best marketing pieces ever. Mm -hmm. But there's, they were saying if it's about exactly the thing that's mm -hmm. causing you pain in your life, you're going to want, you want it all. Like if you could, if you could outline exactly the thing that is causing you negative emotions or pain or stopping you from the thing you want, in this case, you know, beautiful skin or whatever it might be, um, you're going to tolerate more of that. What you're not going to be tolerant of is something that is like continuing to ask you, you know, if I continue to pound those questions about breakouts and you're like, dude, I told you, I don't like, I don't break out. That's not, I, you know, <laughs> what I'm worried about, I got these bags under my eyes. That's a totally different yeah. person. Uh, I mean, they, they can share the same concerns, but there's that that's that's the thing about skincare is that you can have so many permutations of what somebody needs. And so to be more dynamic about that going through, to be more dynamic about that post-purchase. And what we found, you know, in some cases we've accidentally removed the paragraph or like uh, certain images have changed. And we're like, wow, people actually really care about that like short paragraph summary that summarizes their like their responses like we actually i had it like a bug or something like where i was like generic and it applied the same one to all of them mm -hmm. and conversion rate went way down it's like wow it's it is body paragraph it is not that important yeah. but it is specific it summarizes we're like kind of telling you back what you told us and saying we heard you this is the kit for you and so the we heard you, this is the kit for you is super important in the conversion rate. Like their belief that this is the right kit. Uh, that was one of the top questions we always got asked in customer service. Is this, mm. are these really the right products for me, right. right? And so if there's that kind of doubt and you can resolve that, there's there's yeah. significant wins there. And then so on, and then on top of that, you're, you're always thinking about offers and we're now, you know, we're gonna launch four products this year. So how do those products fit in? Uh, how can we maximize the value out of those products, introduce them to them? Are they something we do on the first purchase? Are they something we upsell afterward? So there's constantly new ammunition to like things that you need to be testing. Yeah, full uh, circle back that, to the surveys. Exactly. How do you like quick it? How do you organize all of it? Like in your head, do you keep a spreadsheet? Do you have someone on your team maintain In the terms list? of like testing? Different tests you want to run. Yeah, um, it it's not that organized. I wish it was. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wish it was. Uh, and what I did start to organize is a testing log of historical so that we can like lock down on what did run, what, what can we conclude from it, et cetera. Cause it, it, an odd thing that I do that probably very few people do in testing is I'll run an AB test with and be okay with the outcome of no change. Like, mm -hmm. in fact, I'll be ex excited about the outcome of no change. Um, so for instance, I, I have tested type form versus octane when I was moving to octane. I'm moving platforms. The tech is going to enable me to go through a faster cycle of, of testing iteration improvement. The only thing I want to know is that I didn't F something wrong. <laughs> I didn't screw up the UX of this. I didn't, there's not a bug looming somewhere. And so that was the easiest way is just go send a few, yeah. you know, a few hundred orders for a thousand orders through it, whatever I did. Um, and just know, now I know for certain I'm going to, I'm going to cut over and it's not going to be a problem. So I would be okay with a no change on a test like that. Um, or, uh, you know, I might remove a product and I'm going to just discontinue this product, which means I no longer have to stock it, spend on cash. So like the known, there's known upside as long as it doesn't cause a downside on, you know, the front yeah. end. There's one thing that we spoke about last episode, which is all around personalization and how some of the, like the tests that I wanted to run was, um, specific personalization uh, test based off of ad ID. So if I had a certain angle in an ad, hmm. could I direct that to a landing page that had um, a corresponding headline? Yeah. Right. And and I think when you're, especially nowadays, when you're running ads on Meta, the, the goal is to kind of cast a bunch of different nets and see what different parts of audiences you can get to. Um, but if you're using like a singular landing page like we do, um, you may not be talking directly to that person that comes in from whatever angle you bring it in. Right. I think that's where 
the major pros on using a quiz is, is that you can talk to anybody and everybody, still get them to one singular qu- uh, landing page, which is the quiz, right. and then get them down to where they need to be and still right. make it feel like it's it's meant for them. And yeah, so and, that's, and you've collected then data you can go reuse in all your you know, email retention flows, marketing channels. Email flows, SMS flows, right. everything. Yeah, so I think right. it's, I mean, it, it's one of those things where if you can start moving towards some level of personalization, and whether that be you know setting up redirect tests or a quiz or whatever yeah. it is, I think that's how marketers are going to win moving forward and really optimizing the overall experience. Yeah, and definitely you know even if it, it, it could be like truly dynamic personalization like like what you're driving, or it can be segmented like in the sense of like uh, instead of sending to a general landing page, I'm going to send to like this funnel is more common for me. So I'm going to send to something that addresses that. And it has 80% of the elements of 90% of the elements of this landing page with a headline changed out with different before and afters mm-hmm. or different case studies or maybe one product thrown in yep. or not. Right. And, and, um, and just a little bit more personalized to that um, or segmented to that. And you're following that, like that concept all the way through from A to Z instead of just after the initial ad. Now yeah, I think the generic. more the content, the uh, like we see this with offers too. Like if you're going to yeah. give someone a discount, show it every single mm-hmm. step yeah. through the site and like it's just going to perform better. And yeah, I think personalization or dynamic personalization, like people sometimes get in their own head about, oh, it has to be some crazy thing. It's like, no, it can be rule-based. Just mm-hmm. right. if this UTM, if they come from here, then do this, then do that. Like you can test right. it. And um, yeah, we're seeing more people implement that these days. But there's a lot of demystification of like, hey, yeah. You probably could guess what someone would want to see differently if they click this quiz answer or that one. Right, so right. just Yeah, and, and it's it's funny because like a lot of a lot of people will believe in personalization to the point that they take the dynamic solution over a segmented yep. and they have a product catalog that really is just like it's so easy. You know, you have 20 products. It's not hard to make all the branching logic to mm-hmm. get to like heavy control. Okay, you have ten thousand items, you're Nike. You have to get to a automated version of this kind of personalization, you know right. what I mean? Um, so I, I, that, that's usually what I think is like brands that have small product catalogs, like that's actually a superpower. You have a, a, a high degree of focus on a small product catalog. And so your competitor that this is only one of their 500 SKUs, they're never going to segment these audiences the way you're going to. And you're going to do it manually and you're going to think about it and you're going to make better yeah. content matching and you're going to do it better than they ever could. And, and so I think that's a superpower and like lean into that and, and don't try to over automate what can be, you know, what you could do with uh, individual call it like merchandising logic yeah. instead of, um, instead of like true. Yeah. Like you can go make a kit for dynamic. that thing and have it be the end state of the right. quiz. And then you just double your AOV because right. exactly. you're not suggesting random right. combos of products. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like you're not Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I know we, we talked a lot, uh, a lot of tips, tricks, a lot of tactical advice here. What's one thing that you want viewers and listeners to kind of take back and implement in their business right after watching or listening to this episode? Something to to chew on. Yeah, that's a great question. Let me give just a little bit of education than, than what I would tell you to take back. So I, what I would take back in offer testing in particular is take back the the understanding that your pick and pack cost is mostly fixed. Go look at the actual, like what you pay your 3PL or what you understand your warehouse, right? And so there's usually a fixed amount, like you pay $1.50 or $2 and then 30 cents per additional item picked or something like that. We've negotiated just a flat amount so that we're truly fixed in that sense. So your pick and pack is fixed. Your shipping is mostly fixed, okay? Like, yes, does it go up with a uh, heavier weight with whatever dim, dims, et cetera, unless you're in like furniture and stuff where you're yeah. getting in totally different, different box each time. Right, but like for most uh, uh, e-com, it's mostly fixed or doesn't scale well. Yeah, the chart, okay. you start here and then it's like exactly. a very slow <laughs> slope from exactly. there. And then go look at a pie chart of your cost of goods sold. And the actual product is a lot less of it than you think. <laughs> okay. So those those kind of understandings to begin with, now go realize that you can go create offers that are win-win in the sense that customers love them. You can go add an item for completely free if it pushes them up to a higher commitment. You can say, uh, at, at Modern Fuel, when I was running Modern Fuel, we would say save $100 on the second pen. We we're selling $150 to $200 pens. Save $100 on the second pen. 
or you know, 50% yeah. off, massive discount because putting a second pen in a box costs nothing. It was all, pr you know, product cogs. Already acquired the, the customer. You're already with. sending the box out. You're picking it off the shelf. Right. So, so go into this with the framing of understanding that the product costs that you're adding to a larger kit is pretty much it. And then try to design something that gets a little bit more of a commitment out of the customer with that understanding and then go test it, you know? So there's ways that you can give the customer a lot more value they're gonna find attractive and that will ultimately give you more margin and create a revenue procession lift. And that's the, the core thesis around how I, how I do that. So that would be the, the single most important thing I would say, just go for, for the audience to chew on or to implement is to, to get a little bit better understanding of your unit economics, what parts are fixed and think about how to drive them to a bigger commitment. And the last piece of advice that I'd give on this is if you look for a natural um, affinity, so like they're already purchasing this 10% of the time when they purchase this, that is perfect. If you remember my, my kits earlier in the episode, I said they were already purchasing at 30% and I could drive them to 50%. If, they're, if it's already a natural behavior, you can incentivize it and push it further because that is a true fit. If it's like people never purchase these two things together, to get them to do that is difficult behavior. So you want to look for existing natural fits and then go push a 10% to a 30% or go push a 5% to a 15% and go use incentives to do that. So um, yeah, that would be the little bit of education and what I think that they you know, would be best focused on. Probably the best chew we've ever had. So chew on that. If you want more from us, follow us on Twitter, follow us on Instagram, follow us on TikTok, and check out the website, chewonthis.io.